All right. Happy Tuesday, guys. Um, this is actually like my third time recording because I keep mixing something up in the poem and feeling really dumb about it when I'm finished. So here's hoping third time's a charm. Um, so it's Tuesday, April 14th, and um, I'm going to have us today take a look at the first sonnet that's in our packet, and that's going to be on page three. If you guys go back to your remote learning sonnet packet, um, I had you take a look at page one and page two yesterday. Just a quick disclaimer, I mistakenly called our first poet Edward Spencer on your packet, but it's actually Edmund, so my bad. Um, I had you take a look at you know, step-by-step -step labeling a sonnet. It's pretty hard to do, except when you start seeing it in action, it'll totally make more sense to you. But the poem that we're taking a look at today is on page three, and you're going to see there's three questions, and I'm going to go over that in this um, lesson that I'm going to send um, and, and make sure and also attach to the classroom for you to see. So let's talk about my man, Edmund Spencer. We're going to look at a few from him. This is kind of like one of the first major sonnet writers of the Renaissance. Just for the record, he didn't invent the sonnet. The sonnet was actually established during the Italian Renaissance by a guy named Petrarch. Um, and he has a form that he's associated with as well. Spencer doesn't follow it, but you know, sonnets are these 14 line poems. They're written in iambic pentameter. We know that that's... Um, 10 syllables per line. There's five iams, and an iam is a pair of two syllables, an unstressed followed by a stress. So five times two is 10, and that's how we get iambic pentameter when we analyze poetry. Um, the, all the sonnets that we're studying come from a sonnet sequence, and a sonnet sequence is a collection that is um, kind of linked by theme, and the sonnet sequence that Spencer um, wrote is called Amoretti, which means little cupids or little love poems, and historians believe that these are dedicated to his courtship of Elizabeth Boyle, who became his second wife. Um, so these um, sonnet sequences, again, a sonnet sequence is, is linked by theme or subject. Um, it basically, the, the common theme in a lot of the sonnet sequences is that there is this you know, amazingly beautiful woman and that she's somehow unreachable to the speaker of the poem, but the lover, you know, usually the speaker of the poem, you know, remains true, even though he knows he'll never attain her. Now, Edmund Spencer is the exception to the rule because he does attain his love. Um, but this sonnet that we're going to look at, at least to start with, it doesn't appear that he has wooed her yet at this point in their courtship. Um, this slide here is going to talk about the format of the Spencerian sonnet. It contains what's known as three quatrains. A quatrain is a group of four lines, like a quad has four, four wheels. Um, so three times four is 12, plus one couplet, a couple being two. So that gives us our 14 lines. It's going to follow a certain rhyme scheme. This is going to make a whole lot more sense once we take a look at the sonnet uh, that we're going to start with today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, Sonnet 30 is usually what I start with just to kind of get people introduced. I love this sonnet. Um, it involves a lot of paradoxes or opposites and um, just is a, is a very clever poem. So let's go ahead and read it. it. Says, my love is like to ice and I to fire. How comes it then that this, her cold so great is not dissolved through my so hot desire but harder grows the more I her entreat. Or how comes it that my exceeding heat is not allayed by her heart frozen cold, but that I burn much more in boiling sweat and feel my flames augment and manifold? What more miraculous thing may be told that fire, which all things melts, should harden ice, and ice with, which is congealed with senseless cold should kindle fire by wonderful device? Such is the power of love in gentle mind, that it can alter all the course of kind. So um, to illustrate the rhyme scheme, that's kind of like where I like to start with a sonnet because the rhyme scheme helps us determine like the units of thought within a sonnet. So what I did on the packet as well as, you know, in this illustration here is I have set for you a color that kind of represents the end rhyme sound. So for instance, fire and desire both rhyme. So I assign them the same color. Sometimes, though, the rhyme sound is not like exact, but you can tell it was close enough that the poet was being intentional. And you can see that that kind of applies here. I have great entreat, heat, sweat. It's like close enough. They all kind of end in the same letters. So I'm going to assume that that was an intentional rhyme, but sometimes it's not perfect. Um, so I've assigned those sounds to yellow. Cold, manifold, and told are all in green. Oh, and cold again. Ice and device, as well as mind and kind. When you label sonnets, we assign a letter to the sound, just like in algebra, how we assign variables to represent different numbers, okay? So it's just a represent a representative thing, like a symbol. 
So for every red sound I have there, I assign the letter A. For every yellow sound, I assign the letter B. For every green sound, I assign the letter C, and so on and so forth. And what you can see then is a rhyme pattern that occurs. I have A, B, A, B, but then it stops being A, B, A, B at that point. So I'm going to cut that off. You see, I draw the line across. B, C, B, C becomes a pattern, but then it stops after the next four lines at the end of line eight. C, D, C, D, and then, of course, the couplet. This is establishing the units within the sonnet. So you can, I, I'm going to, when that A, B, A, B pattern stops, it's after four lines, and we have what's called a quatrain. And that's a group of four lines with the same rhyme pattern, okay? Quatrain, again, being four, a quad, four wheels. Um, that rhyme, the, the rhyme patterns change every four lines, and then those last two, mind and kind, they have the same end sound, but it's only a line of two, so that's what we call a couplet. Okay, so let's also talk about a unique factor of Spencerian sonnets. You notice that there is a similar rhyme between quatrain, quatrain one and quatrain two. We call those interlocking quatrains, okay? And those are unique to Spencerian sonnets. We will not see those in the English or Shakespearean. Again, English Shakespearean is the same, or the Italian or Petrarchan, and those are the same, two words of the same type. So let's talk about what this means. So in quatrain one, we have two contrasting images, fire and ice. Um, in this particular case, I have, um, we have two people. One is fire and the other is like ice. Okay. Um, in this case, the speaker is like fire and my love is the person the speaker of the poem adores. And he points out in the first quatrain that the speaker of the ice doesn't melt though when he, the fire, gets closer. Like that's supposed to happen when fire mixes with ice, but it doesn't happen with her. The hunter he gets and gets near her, she gets colder and that like doesn't make sense. Um, Quatrain two, he kind of talks about the opposite that happens. He doesn't understand the speaker why her coldness and her ice doesn't cool down his fire, but in fact makes it burn even hotter. It says, you know, the flames are augmented manifold. They just, they change and get even more. Um, word choice is really important in this section. It talks about the heart frozen or the boiling. This talks about an intensity that the speaker of this poem is feeling. Quatrain three, the, sum, the speaker's kind of summarizing what's occurring to them and then questions how this like defies all the laws of nature. Fire is making ice grow colder and ice is making fire grow hotter. Like this shouldn't be, but yet this is the speaker's situation. And then those last two lines, the couplet, it gives us some closure here and summarizes and kind of comes to a conclusion, a little truth about life here, I guess, that love is so powerful that it can change like the very nature of things. In this case, love is so powerful, it can change the effect that fire and ice have on each other. Um, I just think that's so clever the way the sonnet writer does that. Again, in 14 lines and in iambic pentameter, you'll see every line has 10 syllables and it follows that rhythm of that unstressed followed by stress. It's just super cool. Um, tomorrow, we'll take another look at another uh, Spencerian sonnet. You guys are free to email me or text me any questions you're going to see. I provided basically the answers for you to put for one, two, and three in my discussion. And I'm looking forward to the next one. I hope you guys have a great day.